Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. Everybody look at your hands. Oh, we can dance. Oh, we can dance. Everybody's taking the chance. Dance. Safe to dance. Oh, it's safe to dance. Hey, it's safe to dance. Hello and welcome to episode 235 of the Situational Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. Today I'm on vacation in my motorhome tucked somewhere in a campground in the Great Smoky Mountains. And yeah, even on vacation, the SA Matters mission doesn't rest. In fact, on this vacation, I'll be delivering two programs in South Carolina, having to take a break and fly to a program in Canada, and I'll be recording at least one, if not two more, podcasts while on vacation. That's just what it's all about. I don't mind, though. I love it. In today's feature segment, it's a continuation of a series of flashback episodes I'm running from the early days of the SA Matters show. When I first launched this show back in 2014, I had some amazing guests who shared some incredible near-miss stories. The problem is the show was new, really new, and we didn't have much of a followership. Well, at least not like the followership we have today. So I wanted to give the listeners and the viewers who weren't with us back then an opportunity to learn from some of those powerful stories. Now, for those who may be watching this on the YouTube channel, this interview is coming to you in an audio-only format because back then I wasn't doing my interviews as videos. They were only as audio. Everything leading up to the interview and everything following the interview will be in video. All right, let's jump into my feature segment, a flashback to my interview with firefighter Richard Marcus as he recounts the events that unfolded when the apparatus he was riding in struck a tree. It was uh, May 5th of 2000, I'm sorry, yes, 2006. Uh, it was a afternoon around 3.30, 4 o'clock uh, in uh, the northwest corner of Connecticut when a call came in for a roadside fire. Uh, I responded from my house, which is actually about 100 yards from the uh, station, and we had a full turnout for this response. It uh, consisted of myself, who was about... 11 months on the department at that time. I was 53 years old and I had finished uh, and passed my firefighter one in that uh, past January. Uh, the driver was a more experienced person on the department and he uh, 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 responded with his son who was a 14 year old cadet at that time. My son who also was 14 years old responded as well as two young firefighters who were uh, recently out of Fire One. But they had been on the department for a few years at that point. Uh, the engine was a 1991 Boardman that had uh, two seats in the front and four seats bench style in the back with the firefighters riding backwards. And the engine was equipped with lap belts, but not three-point restraint because of the age of the engine. And everyone was belted in for this call. As we responded, uh, we got a call about two minutes into it that uh, the uh, incident was under control. It turned out that somebody had lit a T-shirt on fire on the side of the road. Um, we... The, we're using codes at that time, and the code that came through was a signal 50, uh, 
And I couldn't remember what that was. It was incident under control. But I turned to the driver and I said, Mike, what's a signal 50 again? And he looked down at the doghouse because I didn't realize we had a list there uh, to see what it was. And as he was looking down, uh, I suddenly said, Mike, look up. You're going off the road. We were coming down a, a back road. It was two lanes. It was windy. It was downhill, uh, tree line, as is most of everything around here. And he looked up and uh, uh, tried to correct. Now, you have to recognize that the period of time this took place in was about the amount of time it would take you to look to your radio to see which button to push and then look up again. It was, it was that fast. He was going maybe 40 miles an hour, I would guess, because we were beginning to slow down uh, to find a place to turn around to head back to the station. Well, he started to correct and went up onto the uh, uh, shoulder. There are no, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, paved part uh, where, the, where the paved road meets the, the side. It's all dirt. And he went up a little embankment. And what we didn't know at that time is that going up that embankment and hitting a rock blew out the uh, right front tire. And he overcorrected into the middle of the road and then came back again. And that's when we started going off the road uh, for the second and final time. And I clearly remember that we, uh, the first tree that we sideswiped took the mirror off of the uh, passenger side of the engine. The second one, we sideswiped the side of the engine. And what I didn't know at that time is it took off most of the side of the engine as well as one of the ladders that was hanging off the side. And the third tree stopped us. Now, I, I don't remember from the moment of impact to when I came to on the ground. Uh, I was told by different sources that I was hanging out of the engine uh, because of the seat belt, the lap belt, uh, and wasn't breathing, and others said I was breathing. Some say I was cut out and lowered down. Some say I was cut out and fell down. But I remember coming to, lying on the ground uh, next to the front uh, tire, and um, my left elbow was on the... Uh, pavement while I was fiddling with the lug nuts with my left hand. <laughs> I was just fascinated by the lug nuts. I don't know why. So, um, things hurt, and things hurt a lot. Uh, and uh, I was convinced I had broken my right elbow, which I hadn't, and that my feet were broken, which they wouldn't. Thank God for quality uh, fire boots. <laughs> you know? uh, I remember being you know, conscious. I remember being lucid. Uh, I was about two miles from home, and my wife had come down after somebody had called her because both myself and my oldest son were involved in the accident. And uh, 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 my two younger kids were in the car and were being kept in the car away from the scene. Um, I was bleeding substantially from a skull laceration that went from my forehead down back to uh, my occiput. Uh, a lot of blood was coming out at that time. I don't remember anything hurting me there. Uh, the uh, uh, one of our sister stations, we have we have three different fire departments in town that are completely separate, three different tax districts. I won't go into that, but one of the uh, other departments responded and took command at the scene, and they did a, a pretty good job of that. Uh, they had called for a number of ambulances uh, along with paramedic response. Now. Only two of us was, were injured. Uh, the the uh, young firefighter sitting behind me backwards uh, got a skull laceration uh, where uh, a, a branch had lacerated uh, his scalp and he needed three staples to put that in. Everyone else was up and walking and conscious and uh, unhurt physically. Um, I was there on the ground, and uh, the paramedic was delayed because they got lost. It's a very rural area, and they needed to be guided in by someone. Uh, I was there on the side of the road for a good hour and a half. Uh, they kept vacillating back and forth about getting a helicopter response, and they, they called for it, and they canceled it. They called for it, and it was busy. The, another one could come, but they decided to cancel that. They went through about six 
attempts to get a helicopter and then canceling the helicopter. And I really can't find out why to this date, other than when I listen to the audio of the call, which I have, in some cases there was nothing available. Uh, they were having trouble starting an IV. My hand was up in the air, and um, I think the paramedic didn't realize how much I was bleeding out. My crit went down to about 24, 22 when I got to the hospital, so I'd lost about half the blood. So my blood pressure was very low. Uh, my wife, who is a nurse in a neonatal ICU, can start an IV in the hair, <laughs> so to speak, uh, but they wouldn't let her attempt it. I know that she could have gotten it in. Uh, now, one of the other things that was kind of unusual was that everyone else got boarded and collared and taken to surrounding hospitals. I never had a C collar put on, and to this date, I can't figure out why. Uh, so my deputy chief was holding traction uh, the whole time, and they finally got me loaded onto a, uh, uh, a stretcher and to the local hospital, which is a rural hospital. Uh, it's not a trauma facility. And it wasn't until I came out of the CT scanner that they put the collar on me. <laughs> what, what the injuries turned out to be were um, I had a, a grade 3 C2 fracture. Now, that's a, a grade 3 C2 fracture is when both sides of the vertebrae are split. It's very similar to what Christopher Reeves happened and wound up being paralyzed from the neck down on a, on a ventilator. Um, so I was very, very lucky. Uh, I had um, a commutated fracture of my right humerus, which required a plate and nine screws. I had a commutated fracture of my sternum. I had uh, five ribs fractured and a left acetabular fracture. So they transferred me by helicopter to um, uh, a hospital in Hartford that was a level one trauma unit and uh, a, uh, uh, had a neuro ICU because of my loss of consciousness. Uh, they told me that it took about 30 milligrams of uh, morphine to settle me down in the ED, which I'm amazed at because 30 milligrams of morphine to me is a, is a large animal euthanasia dose. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I had no idea why it took so much. But uh, uh, I spent the first three days in the neuro ICU, which I don't remember a lot about. And, and then I was moved to the floors for 10 days, sent home, and then had to be rehospitalized again for another 10 days or so. Um, so I was fairly immobile. I, you know, I couldn't roll on my right side because of the commutated fracture in the humerus. I, I couldn't roll on my stomach because of the, uh, the commutated sternal fracture in the ribs. And I was in a rigid collar. The, the, the thing that got me out of going into a halo was the size of the laceration on my scalp. So uh, I'm very grateful for that laceration because I think a halo would have been one of my biggest uh, nightmares. Mm. Uh, so I was in a rigid collar for a time being. And then it was a matter of going through all the different uh, therapies that I had to go through, hand therapy and, and occupational therapy and physical therapy and, and so on. Uh, I, I was also, I forgot to mention, I was also three months out from rotator cuff surgery uh, in that right arm. And uh, 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 I needed to have part of the rotator cuff done when they went in to repair that commutated fracture of the humerus. So it was a, it was a road back um, at that point. It was just a, you know, it, it took a lot of therapy. Uh, the department uh, had, had filed for uh, insurance on the uh, engine within 24 hours. Uh, and uh, I had workers' comp that was helping me out. But it was still falling short because uh, I have a family of five. There's five of us, my wife and my three kids. And I was the sole support for the family of five. And workers' comp wasn't meeting my salary. Uh, I was, we had a significant shortfall on salary. And uh, we went to the town and said, hey, are there any funds that can help us out? And they said, no. And my lawyer said, well, you know, maybe we should bring suit. Um, I didn't want to sue anyone. Um, I, I didn't want to uh, assign blame. I didn't want to sue anybody. But he said we could no, file an intention to sue the town. Uh, and I said, okay, as long as no one else is involved, none of the individuals are involved. And unbeknownst to me, the driver and the chief were both served, which I didn't find out about until two years later, and I was very upset about. Uh, but then uh, the town secretary said, hey, the first selectman secretary said, hey, what about, what about the supplemental insurance? Uh, and none of us knew that the department also was insured by VFIS. 
Uh, and uh, we inquired about that, and it took it took the chief a month to file for that. The, the VFIS representatives actually came over to the house and said, we're ready to go. We just need somebody to file for this. And so once that happened, then um, my salary need, needs were met, and it was a, a very good plan. They really helped out uh, in some uh, wonderful ways uh, in terms of uh, the extra monies uh, that were needed for uh, my care and uh, and uh, family's needs. So, so I think that the people who were also on the engine – were somewhat neglected. I know that our sons went through some psychological trauma that you know got bottled up, um, and the driver, you know, the the, the driver is is a wonderful person. Uh, he's the kind of guy. Some people will give you the shirt off their back. He'd give you the heart out of his chest, mm. uh, and he's been haunted ever since, um, uh, trying to replay it and what did you do wrong and on and on. Uh, mm. So. So that was the the gist of the accident and the long road back. Um, while I was out of commission, I, I decided I could sit in a classroom, and so I started taking some fire classes uh, that didn't re- involve much in the way of heavy uh, fire ground activity at first. Uh, and I was looking for a way to make myself useful while before I could come back to full active duty. Uh, and uh, uh, you know there were some physical problems afterwards like I lost some range of motion in my neck but nothing I can't compensate for a little bit of range of motion in my arm like I can't reach behind me to turn my air on and off I have to do that before I take my uh, SCBA uh, before I put it on Um, and my knees never quite recovered Uh, uh, there was no measurable um, uh, trauma to them but I went through therapy for them had injections there was a lot of pain and I eventually wound up having both knees replaced Um, and one of those went south with a MRSA infection and had to come out and back in and then subsequent reinfections so I've lost a great deal of range of motion in my left knee so I can't responsibly function as an interior firefighter any longer. Uh, but I can do things on the outside and I can teach and I can drive and I can pump. Uh, so I stay active in, in those areas. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and that's the story in a, a nutshell. Um, how as, how go- fast was the truck going when, uh, when he glanced down and took his eyes off the, off the road for just that second? They estimate for me. Yeah, n- none of us are sure. Um, I, I, it felt like it was a little bit faster than it should have been. Um, uh, some of the people on the engine, when I asked that question, uh, didn't think it was too fast. Others did. I know when I ride backwards on an apparatus, uh, I always think that everyone's going you know, a thousand miles an hour. It, that's just how my perception works. So I, I'm going to guess it was between 35 and 40. Mm-hmm. So when when we when we had impact, um, and when we went back to look at that engine later, uh, the uh, the windshield was gone. I was actually wearing my my helmet at the time, and it had uh, flown out. The uh, internal uh, safety part of it, the webbing inside, um, had completely detached from the helmet, and the back of it it was it was a a, a leather helmet was bent at a ninety degrees angle, and you could see the internal structure on the edges of it. the The A post was gone, and uh, you could see where my um, scalp was left in that A post. Uh, there was a, a whole bunch of skin and hair and blood at the uh, little stub of the A post from when I had come forward. And um, the the, uh, the dash panel was completely bent in from where my knees impacted on that. Uh, I, I I don't know if I mentioned, but um, you know, it, yeah, I did mention. It. We only had lap belts in that uh, piece, and the neurosurgeon felt that the reason that I wound up with that C two fracture was because of the lack of a uh, chest um, uh, component to it, a three point restraint. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and then since then, uh, whatever older pieces we had in the department, there were two at that time, everything was retrofitted with three-point restraint, as did many of the local departments surrounding us refit their older pieces with three-point restraint. Mm-hmm. What uh, Was uh, everybody belted? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's good. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, the four that were riding backwards felt an impact but had no idea what had happened. Um, and it wasn't until an initial stunning moment that they started to get out and, and saw the extent of the damage. So. Mm. Um, what did what did you learn from this? What would be the lessons that you you would want uh, listeners to to take away? Well, some of what I learned from it we we've implemented. Um, we uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we make sure that the uh, cabs have three point restraint. Um, and uh, nobody, we've never had a seatbelt problem in our department that I have been aware of, uh, but the apparatus doesn't roll until everyone is, is belted in. Um, also, what we're doing now is that the driver just drives. They're not responsible for the radio. They're not responsible for the siren. The only thing they're responsible for is the actual driving of the piece so that they can have their full attention on the road. Uh, another thing that we do is we've established a, a, um, a driver training program, which has evolved over time. Uh, at first, the driver training program was 10 hours of driving, divided between 10 hours of driving, five hours of driving, and five hours of pumping. But there was no criteria involved. You just had to drive for five hours and pump for five hours. And if everything was okay, you got signed off. So now there's criteria in place of the things you need to accomplish during your drive and your pump time. Everyone in the department has to have uh, a Q endorsement uh, or a CDL if they're going to be driving. And um, there is uh, uh, now every six months you have to re-qualify. They go out with uh, one of the trainers and go through the checklist once again in order to re-qualify. Another thing that we're instituting recently is one of the lessons learned from the airline industry. Uh, you're probably aware that in the airline industry, when you're ascending or descending, uh, until you reach or once you get to that 10,000 foot mark, there's no... Um, uh, chatter in the cockpit. Mm -hmm. We try to eliminate chatter in the uh, cab when we're responding to a call. Oh, uh, that's so huge. So it's only it's only um, limited to uh, uh, um, things that are uh, directly related to the call uh, that we're going to, and that's been a really important change, I think. Yeah, I uh, I talk about that in the uh, Fifty Ways program, the the sterile flight deck uh, because. One of the things that impacts situational awareness of responders is when they're going to the call uh, and there's all this non-essential chatter, especially if they have headphones and you know they're chitty-chatting back and forth about non-related things to the call, it actually impacts their situational awareness. Um, pretty significantly, and as you know, aviation uh, you know, <laughs> got that figured out and created the you know the sterile flight deck uh, policy. And, and I very much encourage fire departments to have their um, well, their flight deck is the apparatus uh, to be sterile. That that is that is a uh, really really powerful best practice you got there. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, it's much. not easy for people to keep their yapper shut. But it allows the officer to concentrate on the officer stuff. It allows the driver to concentrate on the driving stuff. And uh, uh, and I think it's really valuable too that you that you noted that the driver now only drives. You know that they they have. Uh, um, you know, you've limited their potential to be distracted by uh, other things. I think that people um, kind of take how easy driving appears to be for granted. And you know, here here you were in a in a in a blink of an eye, the guy glanced down, and it just took what a fraction of a second. It, it was moments. Yeah. Yeah. For, for those wheels to leave the roadway surface, and and that was it. I mean, there was no recovering from it. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Um, you said that that your members have uh, CDLs, or uh, I think you said 
a Q, Q uh, qualification? Uh, a, a Q endorsement. A Q, Q endorsement. endorsement. What is a Q endorsement? A, a Q endorsement is something in the state of Connecticut that is uh, similar to a uh, CDL, but not as stringent, that allows people to uh, drive emergency apparatus without going through everything that has to be gone through with a uh, uh, to get a CDL. Is that required, or is it optional? It's it's uh, well, uh, you mean in our department? Or, no, 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 in the state. Um, it, it, you know, it's it's supposed to be required, and and the thing is, is that when you ask about the laws, which uh, in our state can be a little strange, uh, anyone is allowed to drive uh, a fire apparatus to an emergency, but if you don't have a Q or a CDL, you can't drive it back. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, whether or not that would ever be enforced or not, I, I don't know. Um, but a Q endorsement lets you uh, uh, qualifies you in a way similar to a CDL, but without quite the steps needed to get your CDL. It also, <laughs> it also, which is in the back of some of our members' minds, uh, the alcohol restrictions are not as stringent. Uh, they're the same as with a driver's license. In our state, uh, uh, driving while intoxicated is if you blow 0.8 onto the meter. If you have a CDL, it's 0.4, and if you blow 0.2, you're pulled for the ro- from the road for 24 hours. Now, um, uh, that is also enforced if somebody with a CDL is driving their own passenger vehicle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, there, are, I've talked to some members who said that the reason they don't want to get their CDL is because of that. Right, <laughs> so, right. So, so then I've wondered, well, do we have a problem here? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't. You know, it, I think if they're you know um, blowing above the legal limit into the meter, there'd be a problem. But I mean, you're you're looking at a firefighter who'd say, well, if I go out to dinner and I have a a glass of wine or a beer, uh, you know, what happens if I, you know, blow point two or point four, you know, which is not legally drunk, but nonetheless can have pretty significant consequences for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's what a Q endorsement is. If you have a Q endorsement, you can't, it doesn't allow you to get other endorsements such as your tanker endorsement uh, or your air brake endorsement. It's just for driving emergency apparatus. Now, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean you can't drive one of our tankers or for those of you on the West Coast, the tender, but <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, they do um, uh, in our state. Now, you have members that have CDLs as well. Oh yes. And who, who pays for that? The department or them individually? Well, it depends. Um, sometimes the department does. Sometimes the individual does. I know. I, I had when I wanted after this happened. I wanted to be the safest firefighter I possibly could be. And so that's one of the reasons I started taking uh, fire classes. And uh, uh, most of those had to be paid by me. The department wouldn't sign off on them. Um, and uh, when I went to get my CDL, the department wouldn't wouldn't support that or help that at all. I had to completely arrange it on my own. And if it wasn't for a friend in the next town, um, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it um uh without an even greater expense than it cost me to do this see what uh, uh, one of the things that was strange about this accident the aftermath of it is i felt as if i was being um ostracized in some ways from the department i felt that i was being looked at differently after this accident and i never I never harped on it or I never said, hey, I almost lost my life for this department. There was never anything like that. It was in the past. But for some reason, I, I just wasn't treated the way that others were. And as I started to um, try to increase my knowledge of the fire service and of things that we do in the fire service, uh, it was met with... Uh, with uh, uh, suspicion and and disdain in some ways, and I never really quite figured that out. Oh, uh, I I got that one figured out. <laughs> yeah, it, it probably didn't have much to do with the accident. I mean, the accident inspired you to um, to get more education. But I have seen and been told and experienced myself um, uh, those who 
go out of their way to better themselves, especially at their own expense and on their own time, really um, can meet with some disdain from others. And and it's like, and, and you'd be thinking, well, they could, they could have done the same thing. They could have went and taken the classes. They, you know, they could have went to school. They could have done this and they could have done that. Nothing, you know, nothing held me back. So, you know, what would be, there be to hold them back? But it's not the fact that that they couldn't do it. They're, they just don't want to do it, but they don't want you to have it either. Yeah. They don't want you to, they don't want you to be smarter than them because then you, you know, look, look at the big threat you become as, as all of a sudden now you're, you know, you're all, all smarter and and they could go and get as equally as smart. They won't, but they don't want you to either. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I, I you know I I think I set a bad tone for my first uh, three years in the department because as I said, as you know, I'm uh, I've been practicing adult cardiology for thirty years now, and in medicine we're always always playing what if. If we start this drug, can we stop that one? If we do this test, can we avoid that test? If Which one do we do first? How do we do it? What will the patient comply with? And so in the fire service, what would happen is I would be told to do something. And right away, my mind would go racing, and I'd say, well, what if I did this or did this instead? Or how about if I did that? It, I can have great moments of density, and it took me about three years before I figured out that my job in the fire service was to say, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and once I figured that out, I would always say yes, sir, and do it. <laughs> uh -huh. But 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 there there are other things, you know. There there are things that that um, I see that bother me, and things that I see that bother me that I can't not say something about. Mm -hmm. And an example of that is is uh, when we have our monthly meetings and we get to safety and compliance, the chief will say we're safe and compliant. We don't have a safety committee. We don't have anyone that functions as a, as a health and safety officer. And we never meet to address issues of safety and compliance, which we have. And we need to sit down and do that. And I haven't been able to get that to happen. Hmm. We essentially don't have SOGs on our department. The SOGs exist in the chief's and the deputy chief's computer. But there's no – if you were to ask me to show you the SOGs walking into our department, there's nothing that I can lay my hands on. Hmm. They made an attempt at one point to introduce some and distribute uh, maybe six of them to the members, some of which were poorly written uh, or, or, or useless. Uh, and uh, then nothing was and, – and, 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 and what really drove me crazy – was that um, I said, let me revamp the water supply SOG. And I revamped the whole thing, and it was really, really good, if I say so myself. <laughs> and, and, but when we started training on water supply, we weren't training to the SOG. Mm. <laughs> we were doing what we always did wrong. Mm. Uh, and, and we weren't using best practices. So, the, so there was almost no point in rewriting that. So, so trying to get SOGs out there and, and to the members and in a place where they can have them. One of our local departments has them all on a, a disc that goes out to every firefighter. Their officers get tested on that before they become officers. Everyone has to sign off on the things that they have read and understand. And updates go out to them on a regular basis, and they train to their SOGs. That's not a hard thing to do. And to me, that's a critical practice to have well-written SOGs, know what they are, and train to them. Mm -hmm. so, so there are things that we're still doing in our department that just drive me crazy, and I try to gently encourage um, these things to come along and, and, and to be developed and offer to help where I can uh, because I, I, I'm, I like writing policy. Uh, this is bad, uh, and this is dangerous. And and I, I like to call, you know, when you read a, a line of duty death report, there's always, always some place in the report where you say to yourself, why didn't they see this coming? Well, I, I, I like to call these things predictable surprises. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if, if something really bad happens, uh, I, I can guarantee it was a predictable surprise. And uh, 
uh, I so want to avoid this because of having gone through um, something like that and uh, keep it from ever happening again. I think Rich's, Rich's ability to, to, to connect with any crowd, that's a, that's a gift that he has, and, it, and it's easily transferable. This is the second or third time that I've heard him speak. There's some teeth to, to the information that he, that he brings. It's been really good. Good mixes. He knows when to throw in a joke here and there to get you back involved. Some tools. Um, I'm a new lieutenant, so very, very interesting. And some of these things I can take back to the station and use with some of the new firefighters I have my, on my crew. Something to get you thinking about your job more. Big picture type stuff. I've seen him before. A good review for sure. I have heard him before, yes. After he speaks, there's usually an enlightenment because now they're more aware of what's going on around them and what they're experiencing as they're responding to calls. He's, he's very, very knowledgeable. I'm enjoying it so far. And that intuition, that's a big one. Um, the video that he just showed up here, we're getting a lot out of this. this is, I think this is a really good seminar, especially for new people and old. But I think it's, it's very informative. This talk gives us more ammunition to, to do all three. They're relatable to what we have experienced or very well could experience, so it makes it easy to let the knowledge sink in. I mean, it's awesome. A lot of stories you can usually relate to yourself and, and calls you have been on, you know, aha moment. Like, he just helps you focus on picking out the right things. It's, it's awesome. It's a refresher and keeps my eyes open. It's good stuff. If people listen to the message that he has, it's an incredible message delivered by a very com compassionate person strategy and tactics are going to always change situation awareness is it doesn't change you're all, it's always there he's got some good stories to tell and he's very thorough with his stories and it's uh, interesting listening to him very clear speaker and he, he talks um, on our level because he's been there he's been in the trenches I think he's doing well and I'm looking forward to the second half of Thank you, Richard, for participating in the interview and sharing the lessons learned with our listeners and viewers. Since 2007, SA Matters instructors have helped more than 1,200 organizations and over 67,000 individuals improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, school bus drivers, aviation workers, oil refinery operators, and more. If you work in a high-risk, high-consequence decision-making environment, then we're here to help improve your safety and your survival, and to help you accomplish the most important mission of all, and that's to go home to the ones who love you. Welcome to Chief Miller. Chief Miller operates the largest social media page dedicated to the men and women of the fire service from around the world. Check him out on Instagram at Chief underscore Miller. Find him on Twitter at Chief underscore Miller. And check out the website where you can find Chief Miller Apparel at ChiefMillerApparel.com. I'd like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent Situational Awareness Matters training for their team members. Eagle Materials Corporation in Grapevine, Texas. The Odessa Fire Department in Odessa, Texas. The Columbia Shoe Swap Regional District in Salmon Arm, British Columbia. The Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in Kittery, Maine. The Minnesota Fire Chiefs Association Conference in St. Paul, Minnesota. The Association of, Cur of Canadian Ergonomist Conference in Sudbury, Ontario. The Loudoun County Fire Officers Seminar in Leesburg, Virginia. If you're interested in attending one of our upcoming programs, here's where we're going to be. On October 28th at the Clearwater Regional Fire Service Conference in Alberta, Canada. November 3 and 4, the Anderson County Fire Department just outside of Greenville, South Carolina. November 7. University Heights Fire Department, University Heights, Ohio. November 8th, the Volunteer and Combination Officers Section, Symposium in the Sun, Clearwater Beach, Florida. November 14, Rogue Interagency Training Association, Medford, Oregon. November 19, 
the Shoreline Fire Department in Shoreline, Washington. And then November 24 through December 11, Sincrude Oil Refinery, Fort McMurray, Alberta. To see the locations of all the upcoming Situational Awareness Matters Tour Stop events, just head over to the SA Matters website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Live Training Dates. If you're interested in hosting a program, just visit the website and click on the Contact Us tab on the top of the homepage and I will give you a call. If you want to become part of the SA Matters community of learners, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Just check the show notes for how to get connected with us through our newsletter membership, our podcast subscribers, YouTube subscribers, and how to follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we share lessons about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 235 of the SA Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, firefighter Richard Marcus, for sharing your story and your lessons learned to help us be safer. Thank you to our awesome sponsors, Midwest Fire and Chief Miller. Thank you to all the companies, agencies, organizations, and associations that have hosted Situational Awareness Matters training programs. Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted the live, virtual, internet-based training events. Thank you to the more than 2,500 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. And most importantly, thank you the listeners and the viewers of this show for sharing some of your valuable time with me. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgassaway.com.